Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you might be in the world. We are Compact and Bijou at the moment. We shall see who else joins us shortly. Um, first of all, I have to um, have a, a micro discussion with Bruce. You've stolen my summer. Every one of your videos has got nice weather in. I've got my glider ready to go because it was nice weather. And then ever since then, it's been awful here. Can I have my summer back, please? Yeah, well, at the moment, it's windy and wet, so it's probably blowing your way. But no, it has been really good, actually. Most impressed, hoping for a very long summer uh, because last summer wasn't too bad, but you can never have a summer that's too long. No, no, that's true. That's true. That's true. All right, good. Well, now we, we've moved this summer thing out of the way. I think what we'll do as no one else has arrived, I was expecting just yeah. Oh, I know the other thing I was going to curse. Well, hello there, Richard. Good day to you in the comments. A new flippin' um abbreviation atmx atmx air traffic management exploration where are we going to go next with all this nonsense um can we stop already or have you found any new uh acronyms that we might be using bruce no just that extended visual line of sight thing which everyone's talking about at the moment which is crazy stuff crazy when you say extended visual line of sight that would mean not really that useful an extra little thing but we can have another 20 pages in the manual because of it yeah we've got to have people stationed so it's still line of sight but not necessarily line of sight of the operator someone he's talking to can still be looking at it and they have to be with it and like what's being proposed in australia at the moment is you have to be within 500 meters at all times like the, the observers must be no more than 500 meters from the craft and the pilot must be no more than 1.5 kilometers from the craft so it's it's a bit of a joke really Mm, no, it is, isn't it? It is, it is, it is. Anyway, we should, I should, I should uh, introduce and greet Chris uh, Brisbane there. Chris, good day. How are you? Welcome to you. Your first outing here. Oh, yeah. Thanks for having me on. I'm doing pretty well. <laughs> That's very good. I, I'm very, very impressed with your, um, your, uh, your, your uh, augmented reality work. But before we talk about that, let's just say hello to Nicolo. You've just been lazy and not joining us for the last couple of months or so. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> and you've been learning at the feet of Bruce, the master of short answers. So well done. let's dive back to um, to Chris um, as, as you're here and you and you kindly joined us. Now, augmented reality and my my drone. Surely I've got enough uh, information looking at the map that I can see when I'm flying my Phantom or whatever. What, what else? What could I possibly use augmented reality for? Surely it's just a buzzword that you're trying to fish for us with. Well, I think you could use it for disaster response. Um, there's a lot of other uses for it, uh, augmenting the visual airspace. Uh, it provides you one true common operational picture. Um, basically, if I was flying, uh, say, the uh, hurricane response, I could fly, I could look at houses, I can click on them, I can tag them as damaged, uh, get real-time damage assessment back to the EOC, uh, even if it's just a lat and long and a, a damage value. So with that, there's a lot more to it you know, of actually getting the intelligence out. You see a lot of videos that have the roads flooded and uh, there's no mention of where they are. So there's no situational awareness um, other than the fact that you've got major flooding going on. I did I did see in one of your videos, which, which did impress me. And uh, if you look um, for Chris on LinkedIn, you'll see a lot of his stuff there. Um, you, you had uh, the road names coming up as as the aircraft was flying so it's like you go i don't know where you pulled it from probably google map i don't know but anyway the road name was superimposed on the road so obviously if we're watching that live video feed we're an instant commander or something like that or somebody nowhere near the arpaz you'd know where it is without uh without having to resort to a map how well i guess you're not going to tell us how you did that but how um is that done downstream, as it were, that it's not on board the drone, it's not on board the ground control station? How would that get on that image-ish without giving away secrets? Basically, the geospatial uh, information is merged with the video layer. Um, both are, are aware of the 3D space, and we merge them together um, on the PC or the Android client. 
Okay, and then so so if uh, if if I was stood next to a fireman or whatever the the emergency was, they could look over my shoulder and see that. What about um what about things like because I must I do have a vested interest because to me this is where ground control stations must surely be going. I can see a world in which I have a three sixty camera on my head or roof of the van that I'm sat in, a set of VR goggles on, going the full Monty here. And I can turn my head and see the entire situational picture around where I'm operating. You know, the sky and ground hazards and everything. It's got to be. Gary has a hairy chest. Oh, bloody hell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> uh, this is all falling apart already. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no after, after you, Chris. He's, 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 just, he's ruined my thoughts. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can take everything from ADSB uh, and integrate that into, you know, geospatial databases, uh, geo server, Esri software and all that. And, uh, you know, just have that full 360 situation awareness just by tuning the head tracker into it with a 360 view. Yeah. Yeah. It's got to meet a lot of requirements of, uh, of aviation authorities and you'd be over and above what a manned aircraft could do very very quickly um and i what why isn't why isn't there a rush to doing this i don't quite understand that's where i'm kind of puzzled at you know um a lot of people are not even integrating their gis data from counties into uh, situational awareness products so i kind of think i've addressed sort of the niche market into making this one true common operational picture and um, just providing the most amount of intelligence without an overload of what you need to know what's going on, you know, in the incident. And, you know, you take the uh, school shootings we've had lately, unfortunately. And I mean, you can put a drone up and you can watch the perimeter with it. If all your sheriff's deputies and police officers are running GPS trackers with low update times, like one to two seconds, you can actually see the icons moving on the map. Where if you've got somebody walking out of the side of the building that has no icon on them, you know, you better go check them out and you better be watching them. So, you know, aspects like that just bring in a whole new factor to the awareness of it. I, I, we should, probably shouldn't talk too much because you should probably should be protecting your ideas like Billio. Uh, <laughs> I, I can't believe people haven't. Have you heard of many systems like this, Bruce? No, it's interesting. That there, it does seem to be a, a solution looking for a problem. And that probably raises again the whole issue that everyone's overestimating the use of drones. I mean, this is this sounds fantastic, but perhaps the reason it's not being taken up is because they just aren't that many drones being used for this type of application. Therefore, it's, it's sitting there waiting for the market to catch up with it. Oh, I think I think first response, I think the emergence, I think this year has proved to be the year of uh, uh, emergency crews using and using correctly and getting really solid results out of RPA. I think this is the first proper year of in-service RPA, uh, small stuff, small quadcopters that are making a difference. Um, and I'm sure they would would just absolutely uh, jump on it. And then if I'm just as a as an operator, uh, the because at the moment we I do bring uh, ADSB uh, I can bring ADSB data to the field, but that'll be on one laptop. I've got my ground control station, and I might have uh, the video feed as well. So I've got straight away I've got three three screens to look at, if if you will. And uh, I, 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 we're not all as quick as you, Bruce. We can't, uh, or, or uh, Nicola, we can't, you know, drive our heads around between all these screens. If I could have everything on one display, I mean, job would be a good one. Yeah, but then as soon as one manned helicopter enters the the theatre, everyone's coming down. Well, that's that's a different kettle of all games, isn't it? That's a different conversation, really, is, is getting out of the way of that sort of stuff. Well, but, it, is it, is, it is the same conversation. If you've got a, an emergency response, quite likely part of the emergency response is going to be manned aircraft. And until we have this UTM, this ability to make sure that everything is separate, then you have a massive management problem on your hands. How do you coordinate the unmanned versus the manned aircraft under the current regulations? And so 
you, you then have a big management problem that you don't have until you bring drones in or onto the situation. So we need to have a lot more work taking place in terms of integration and coordination between manned and unmanned aircraft for really to get the maximum benefit from um, RPAS in a disaster situation. I mean, if we, when we have firefighting, for example, forest fires, uh, fire crews can use drones to locate hotspots very quickly and easily, but we've been told you must not fly drones near helicopters fighting fires. I mean, it's like, uh, I think until there's some sort of uh, clearly laid out um, strategies for managing both types of aircraft in the same piece of airspace, we're always going to have a bit of a problem. Well, I think I think we've moved. I think we're at that summer where that's happening. I think the gold commanders are are sat talking to the RPAS operators and now part of the team. So they are part of the effort now. I suppose we're talking we're talking about the people that should be there, not just the the sightseers. Um, and you know, maybe maybe we're beginning to make a case for electronic identification and all those other things we don't want. But yeah, I mean, if you've got all that running, then. Uh, Right, come on, it's got to be a good idea to pull everything into one picture, isn't it? And and then you could have three or four headsets instead of, you know, this this Oculus Rift died, so I'll go and pull this other one out that I've got here, rather than having to replace dozens of screens. I, I well, that's an idea. I, it excites me. Yeah, it, it's a great technology. I just don't think we're quite there yet in terms of being able to push a button and have everything coordinated at once. In some cases, it seems to have worked, but we want a package system that any first responders can use and roll out so that they can be sure that their helicopter is not going to encounter a drone and, and vice versa and so forth. And th there needs to be a, you know, a shrink wrap package that'll do that, a well-organized, coordinated, um, structured system for doing that. And everyone's doing their own little implementation. So as I say, this could be the core of something that would really be useful across the board, but we've got to get people to, to agree to one you know, or a very small subset of all the available options. And so it boils down now to marketing. It's just going to be marketing. You've, you can have the best mousetrap in the world, but if you if you can't sell it, it's not going to make you any money. So I think all the tech companies tend to, or all the small tech companies, grossly underestimate the importance of marketing and the amount of money that has to be spent. For every dollar you spend on research and development, you've got to spend 10 on marketing the resulting product to the prospective audience. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll jump back to Chris in a second, but that allows me to pull in the idea that a Precision Hawk have just laid off 40 people and they've spent, well, maybe not 40 people, but anyway, I hear, I hear various stories. Um, uh, but uh, they've spent plenty of money on marketing and their boss, their owner, is the bloke from Red Hat. So they've got money up the yin yang to put themselves uh, at the top of the pile. Perhaps I should have said effective marketing. Um, if, you look, <laughs> <laughs> if you compare Altitude Angel with Air Maps, it's a great example. I mean, you look at um, Air Maps, they're throwing heaps of money at promoting their product into marketplaces. Altitude Angel are building, in my opinion, a far better product, but they just don't have the marketing presence to get that foothold. And ultimately, it boils down to it's not the best mousetrap, it's the best marketed mousetrap. And that's why we end up with so, so much crap in the marketplace that's selling well. Well, ah, but is it is is it actually selling well, or are they shouting hard until they run out of the VC money? Uh, which I think is, and and we are probably reaching that point where a lot of uh, the companies that were invested early, shall we say, in the game, are beginning to run out of that money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that boils down to ultimately, everyone has overestimated the size of this market at present, and so they're all that they're expecting a market that's much bigger. Therefore they're not getting the return on their investment. That's why these companies are folding. They expected this to be a $75 billion a year industry, according to Coopers and whatever. And, you know, but this never eventuated. It's it's growing much more slowly, primarily due to the effect of regulation. And regulators are still way behind the eight ball. They're taking far too long. They're only just now talking about extended visual line of sight when we should have been doing BB loss, you know, five years ago. But um, they are dragging the chain, which means we will see a lot more of these companies go to the wall or have to significantly curtail their operations, which is why it never pays to be too early in an industry like this. You you know, you can you can blaze a trail and then die at the end of it and everyone will walk over your corpse as they make money. It's not the right way to do it. <laughs> you devil, you. I was, I've been looking at management. I've been looking, because you know me, Captain Business, I've been looking at all these business things to find out life cycles of, uh, of, of industries and or new industries and whatever, because I, I think at the moment, so I thought I'll try and make a video. My video would have been about how... Um, 
how nasty the image uh, the industry is now oh someone's pinging me from somewhere where's this pinging happening from i'm being pinged <laughs> i've got to find this pinging but it, it's getting nasty but you just unfortunately in one simple line there you, you did the whole walks over the courses not the corpses right i must uh, i must make a note of that but i think uh, this will be could potentially be a fantastic um a product for 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 bv loss uh or or actually chris tell us where 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 so where are you at with your ideas and your product what 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 point have you reached i've actually got uh dji supported fully uh, i'm working uh with mavlink integration right now uh the big problems with that is going to be getting the gimbal data um i'm gonna have to tap the serial port and get it in that way and then calibrate it. But um, from the DJI platform, it's fully ready to run offline in an unconnected environment. And um, I just give it the GIS data and off I go with it. Okay. And so you, so that's integrating into aircraft. Uh, I think I saw, did, what, did you have a Sky Viper or something there in the background? Have you got yeah. it working on a... A forty-nine dollar aeroplane, as it were. <laughs> I've got it on the hundred dollar journey. Hundred dollars. Eh? So, so but, uh, what, but so what could it do? So if I was flying that, I would see through where uh, through your own app or whatever. I would see a video feed with the roads and stuff overlaid on it. Right. Yeah. Tower structures, um, address points on the ground, all that. You know, it's the fixed camera, so it's going to kind of limit what you're able to see. But um, it bring good situational awareness. If you're up airborne, you know, and you're heading toward a tower structure and all that, it would really help out there. And you've pulled, but it's, um, what am I struggling to understand? I'm struggling to understand just how much data you must have either coming via a, uh, an internet connection to the tablet or sat on the tablet. You must have terabytes of uh, data of obstruction information and all that sort of thing. Or does it boil down? To, I'm sorry, I'm, if I'm pulling out your secrets or trying to. Or does it boil down to a very small amount of data if you package it correctly? It's actually using JOSIN, uh, JavaScript object notification, basically. So it's actually very small amounts of data. Uh, I can do KML, shapefiles, um, in several other formats, but I've tried to get everything over to GeoJoss, and so I have a real small payload. Therefore, in the disaster environment, when you're limited on connectivity speeds and everybody's trying to upload videos and all that, hopefully it makes it through quicker. And uh, transport methods could be using, say, a Gotenna, for instance, to transport some of that data back and all that. So. We had um, Greg, Dr. Greg Kretzinger came and he came and uh, spoke a, a few episodes ago about what I think was a very obvious idea, which was just drawing down a road that uh, that was possible or impossible and marking um, marking or, or damage and stuff like that and uh, and and only sending that very small kml back because in times of emergency you haven't got the bandwidth to uh, to be sending hundreds and hundreds of big photos um and i and i thought that was amazing so i think you you should talk to um uh, to gregory uh, dr greg and uh, you two should should start working together on something like this it sounds it sounds a perfect fit to me i know bruce is very hard to uh, to get excited about anything it's very hard <laughs> What do you reckon there, Nicola? What's, what situational picture would you like in life? Or not at all? Oh, is it the time that he left? It's the time he left, He's isn't it? Gone to sleep. Oh, oh he just moved in. Sorry, I didn't move. Really... Okay, can you repeat that? Oh, we were just saying how we didn't like you. Um, right. <laughs> like that. yeah, yeah, that's what we say. <laughs> no, what sort of you, you're the Fair big, um, and, and actually, you were telling me before you started that in your country, uh, apparently, your regulator will let you fly BV loss with a, a fairly simple permission, which was amazing. What big situation in a dream situational picture would you like uh, to have or to see? Uh, 
we're talking about the augmented reality thing. Yeah, or, or your or, ground control station, or what? what's your perfect picture, your perfect... Money's no object, because Bruce is going to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, then. Then we're talking. All right. Um, I haven't really thought about augmented reality, but... Uh, <sighs> the box if we're talking about reserved airspace which is the oh dear good world internet we find these uh okay yeah can you hear me now uh that didn't work so well so i think the first thing you want is a decent internet connection <laughs> Now, the thing is, I'm using Stender because my route is now a few walls over and it's not really working well, so I need to change all that. And then Let what happened was, <laughs> and suddenly... <laughs> Let me try something else. All right, we'll let you try. Let try something else. We will let you try something else. <laughs> Shane, come on. Yeah, no, I personally, I think it, it has to. I can see all ground control stations eventually having an element of augmented reality, having to switch between multiple screens as a, a nonsense, and we are sort okay. of tied to an old way of doing business uh, with how we display information and we've got to get away from that in the, in, in the modern world yeah. and if it can I be done go on bruce pro proximity alerts would be useful if you're flying over terrain for example it's very hard to know what your, your um, uh, altitude above ground is because the contour of the terrain changes and you've only got an altitude above usually above sea level or relative to your takeoff point so that'd be nice to have a, a true agl uh, read out. The other thing is, if you're working in an area where there is, as you say, like transmission lines or towers, it would be nice to have proximity alerts so that when you got within so many meters of a potential risk, you that was flagged, it was um, automatically alerted you rather than you having to keep an eye on things. So have, being able to set alarms on potential risks to the craft and then use that that um, information to highlight them, either you know, sort of flash them in red or something. Those are the sort of things that be useful, certainly from a safety perspective and a navigational perspective. Mm. Mm, no, absolutely. And of course, kind of, uh, whoa, that was loud. We already have the, <laughs> sort of <laughs> that data there with Altitude Angel being a mission planner. And you can actually pull in um, uh, uh, terrain maps as well. But he's, you, you being one of those old fashioned handy sort of flyers, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know that. But you can also put in pr pretty accurate um, terrain <laughs> maps as well for terrain following. But yeah, and, or, or, and, and anything that's coming up where you're looking as well, if it's you know, in your heads up display, is is easier, isn't it? Um, so I, I know I think Chris is, is is ahead of the game, and I'm confused as to why others aren't digging into that market. Really, it'll it'll be I can see this quickly becoming the default standard. <laughs> Could be, but you see, I uh, for a person that usually likes to chase clouds around or just goes high and far, I don't really need, uh, you know, terrain details or power line warnings or whatever. But what would be useful because I usually tend to feel kind of lost up there, and if it wasn't for that home arrow. <laughs> Wouldn't even know where to go back to because when I'm 27 kilometers out and over two kilometers high, not that easy to orient yourself over the terrain. But uh, augmented reality, perhaps, you know, roads and uh, would be nice to see, like, if you're flying close to the border, as I usually am, to see exactly where that is because I've sort of set it as a goal for myself you know at some point i gotta get over that <laughs> the <laughs> serbian the serbian border i mean so it would be nice to actually be able to see where that is in real time as i'm flying there well and uh I, and we interrupt your program now to welcome mick malloy live from the outback challenge uh good day mick can you hear us good day yes i can hear you how well, are you doing thank this morning we're very good. We're very good indeed. Thanks very much. So what is happening? It uh, must be early in the morning at the Outback Challenge. Uh, about so half past seven. Just after 7 a.m. here. 
Um, we got some catch-ups. We had some bad weather yesterday, so the high school teams that were meant to finish yesterday are uh, finishing off their competition this morning. And then we get into the main competition about 11 o'clock, which is about uh, three or four hours from now. Okay, and for those of our viewers that don't know, the Outback Challenge is, in my opinion, the drone competition, if I must use that word. Um, uh, it is th This is the one to go to and the one to win. All the rest are mere weak imitations. Um, Tridge and... Up to, and go up on. to $75,000 on offer this year. Okay, and then uh, and what what is the what is the main event? Or well, first of all, what are the what are the the schools teams doing? So the high school teams, if you can see, um, no, I can't see the video I'm actually sharing here. Let me swap so I can see that a bit better. All right. So do you prefer this angle, or do you want me to rotate it? <laughs> I don't think it's an answer for that, is it, mate? <laughs> All there right, so this is the, the high school competition. They need to fly between over those hurdles and drop a, um, a medical package down to Outback Joe, who you can see there. That's the famous Outback Joe sitting on the chair out there. Um, and, yeah, so they're using uh, multi-rotor systems to do that. Um, most of them are autonomously sensing the um, location of Outback Joe, either by GPS or by uh, other means, and dropping their package to him automatically. Okay, so is it t one touch, uh, one button touch and go, and then drop package and come home, or uh, are they flying it manually? Simple remote control all the way through to that. Yeah, there's, there's varying levels between the teams. So we've got and I, high schools from um, America here this year um, and Australia. And the uh, I guess it's a lot more points if you manage to, to do it completely autonomously. Yeah, so the more autonomy you can use, the higher the points, the more points that are available to you in the competition. Wow, that's fantastic. And then, and the, uh, so if, if they've entered that, as have, have there been any examples of high school students moving from that and moving on to the adult one once, once they get of that age? Yeah, I mean, there's people that are in this competition. This competition is probably one of the longest running since 2007. And there's people that have been involved in the that early competition that are now working for. Uh, for Boeing, um, for in situ, for other large um, companies like that, um, that have moved on and gone into their careers in that, uh, into airline pilots as well. And no, it's, it's a cracking competition, and I, I love having followed it from the start. I love the fact that the aircraft never, that you know, in the first few years, just getting airborne was difficult, and and leaving even leaving the airfield was ne next to impossible. And it was quite a few yeah. years until it was actually won the first. Uh, competition yeah, it was it wasn't until i think uh, i think it was seven years before the uh, first mission was completed so yeah no that's it's it's a very impressive competition so we've mentioned leaving the airfield what the the, the adult teams the main events the one that tridge and uh, canberra uav are doing what what do they what are you hoping that they'll what do they have to do so again depending on the level of the competition that they've entered there's various levels uh, pretty much hands off so Leave the field here, take off. Um, most teams are taking off vertically um, using a um, quad plane design. They travel down to a predetermined spot. Um, they're given the rough location of, um, the, the, of Joe. They travel down there, that's up, um, nautical miles away. Um, so beyond visual line of sight, find him, um, land. And then the, uh, a blood vial is delivered to the UAV, a button's pressed, and then it returns to home all autonomously. And then um, there's other parts of the competition where they can um, they get airspace users thrown at them as they're, as they're going or coming um, uh, via a network feed. And that could be other aircraft in the area, birds, clouds, and they need to autonomously avoid those as well as as coming or going. So, I miss the you. You just dropped out when you said the distance. So, how far away roughly is um, Joe? Um, it could be up to uh, over twenty nautical miles. Twenty nautical miles away. Now that's BV loss flying. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and how so? How does you your out here? It's uh. I'll just do a pan around for you where we are. We're out at uh, Dolby in Queensland. If everyone wants to look, look, look up where that is. Oh, again. There you go. So, 
And so uh, did, is there a great big rush to get up onto that uh, spiral staircase I saw there for antennas? No, no entry there. That's uh, there for the, uh, the competition um, staff and our systems we use, not for the not for teams. But, yes, given how flat it is here, everyone likes the, uh, the high ground. And that well, so is that roof now? Oh, and here's James. Here is Canberra UAV is joining us as well. Oh, there's a bit of something. Uh -huh. What am I looking at there? <laughs> I'm looking oh, at I think I've got the camera facing the wrong way, but that's the spare porter, Gary. It's a spare porter. Good day to you, James. Thanks very much for joining us with two cameras from the Outback Challenge. What more can we yeah. ask? This is like multi multimedia tastic. I'm oh, James. through the pits and we'll see what's happening. Perfect. Thanks, Michael. You, you get on to the pits and I'll just have a quick word to Michael. And then, uh, uh, good to see you, mate. Good to see you. Uh, half the man you used to be. Um, Michael, uh, yes. yeah, yeah, uh, James, the uh, that so that's the spare porter, but how quickly could you get that porter out if you needed it? Surely that's <laughs> no, that, that one's been retired for the year, Gary. It's um, it is a spare aircraft, but it's more spare pieces if we need it at the moment. Um, we're flying third up today, so we really don't have time to um, to switch aircraft, and we wouldn't at this point. Absolutely. And uh, I see you have comfy chairs there. Oh, look at that. We've seen, we're missing the stuff on the other side. We'll come see back what to you. can see on these ones. I'm just uh, hiding in a, in a room so that um, I'm not disturbing Tridge, who's at the table doing sittle. <laughs> doing sittle. He's doing a run. All right, let's just cut to Michael then. So what are, what are we seeing here, Michael? Is this the student entries? No, this is the this is the um, one of the, the teams from. Uh, you want to introduce yourself? Say hello. This is live. Yeah. yeah. This is, uh, this team from India. India. Bakshar team. Yeah. And tell us about your yes. aircraft. Yeah, it's a multi-rotor for the landing. So yeah, so they've got um, one's a retrieval aircraft, yeah. and one's a support <laughs> aircraft that helps with communications and other things. Yeah, this is the yeah. landing. Okay, and the. And what's special about these ones? This one, this is only for communication. Yep. Relay. Communication relay. This is a right area Okay, and it's a uh, hybrid. The Pri yeah, Prius, yeah, of, hybrid. Prius of the sky. Yeah. It's a hybrid. Thank you very much. Oh, it's a hy hydrogen in there. No, no, just an IC engine the jet with the generator. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. 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 Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so none uh, of the teams, it's early here. It's not a lot of the teams are here yet, so. That's a screen and a half. And we're looking, we're, we're from our other camera that's there from James, we are getting um, some a worried, furrowed brow of Tridge, I think, there. <laughs> <laughs> How's it, Tridge? How you doing, mate? Mm, let's quick zoom in, zoom in. Let's look. Let's get the skin. It's only seven thirty. And uh, yeah, did I hear that you were third to fly or something like that? Yes, that's right. Uh, although that you know, teams can move around a little bit depending on um, uh, if they're not ready, they can elect to go to the back of the queue. Uh, so it wouldn't be surprising to find that we're second or first to fly if, if other teams had issues that that's happened in previous years. Okay. And would I be right in thinking the facilities are getting ever better at this location? I don't recall in years oh, one or two. It's an absolutely brilliant flying club. It's, it's uh, amazing, well set up, really friendly locals. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's one of the best flying clubs around. It's quite incredible. 240 volt power in the pits, which is great. Uh, and of course, the organisers have, have you know, put on lots of extra facilities with the enormous marquees. And they've got, you know, food laid on and, uh, yeah, just really, really well done. It's, a, it's an incredible effort that the organisers put into this whole thing. Yeah, it's amazing. And, well, all, all the best to you, um, you guys. Uh, obviously, we have to declare a bit of biased interest, I suppose. But pilot entries, which is good to see. Yeah. No, are, are there... Uh, um, yeah, I, I think just about everybody be uh, RG pilot. Well, no, I've only seen a couple of them. So there's Delft is very interesting. They've got they're based on paparazzi, um, and uh, they've got a very sophisticated system with their combination helicopter, uh, a biplane, uh, Delta Wing helicopter. Uh, it's an amazing machine, really, and uh, a huge effort they've put into the software side on, on paparazzi. 
Um, and uh, we've got the uh, the Canadian team um, at Ford Robotics, which have all their own software and their own hardware, just a, a two-person team. Again, a huge effort. This is their third competition, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, massive effort they've put in. Uh, and then we've got one PX4 team, I think. Um, and then the rest of the team. Uh, I'll, 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 we'll leave you to it, Trish, because we're taking your valuable time. Thank you very, very, yes, very much. No sure worries. I'm going to sign off too, Gary, but um, thanks All for right, dialing man. in and um, we'll chat later. Bye. All right, Jack. Cheers, man. Thanks very much. Um, anyone else got any questions for the Outback Challenge? Well, we've got it there. It's amazing. No questions. Okay, from... sorry. By playing Delta Wing something Vito. Yeah, Somebody. it's 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 got a great big um, helicopter rotor for the main uh, prop. It's got two multi uh, multi rotor blades on the wingtips of the biplane, and it's a tail sitter. So it's a tail sitter, just the biplane wings, big prop in the middle, big helicopter blade in the middle, and two little props at the, on the outside of the door. Then away it goes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, last one, close the door. <laughs> Same, man. So, Mick, what are, we, what are we seeing now? That was a team just coming uh, out, and then... Uh, so, team, one team finished, another high school team's coming out at the moment. Okay. Yes. They're getting their time now, so they're getting their accelerometer. So, part of this also is that the device has an accelerometer in it. They're not allowed to exceed a certain number of G-forces. Okay. When it hits the ground, so so the package they're delivering stays viable. But here you go. This one's about to, end, about to take off, if you want to watch. Yeah. We'll watch that, and we'll probably let you let you go then. It's been very kind of you. Yeah. And of course, in the first couple of years of this, there was no internet coverage out at the airfield. And now here you are talking to us on this. Yeah. Well, what's happened since 2007 with uh, internet speeds and coverage and. Yeah, like. it's amazing. So they're going to fly over those, or they're going to fly over and back through them? Is it like FPV gates? They've got to fly over the top of them, so that's like the height. They've got to fly, enter in over the top. There is a time they need to go between those two as well. Um, and if you look down on the ground, uh, you see the two boxes on the ground. That's a, a, a laser um, detection system to, to do the timing. And then Joe does. In previous years, Joe had an IR light to for people to help uh, find him. Does he still have that one out on the main competition? No, that was in the that was in the main challenge, not in this one. Yeah, uh, he had a high IR light originally. Then he was it was human recognition, and now uh, given that it's a known location, it's a uh, um, uh, identification target that uh, the team supply that we can put out that there. So right. So, Example, if a doctor said, here, print this, put it on the ground, and the drone will come and land at it. Okay. So teams have all got different sort of things that they want their, their vision system to recognise. Um, yeah, so that gets placed out on the ground, and then it comes down and lands at those. Lots of screaming. Teams do have a time frame, I believe it's um, for each. I think it's twenty minutes for the <laughs> <laughs> to do their three drops. Okay, oh, they're going to do three in that time. Yeah, three. Have they done any yet? We can't really tell. Uh, I can, can, yeah, it's a bit glary today. And you just took off. Oh yeah, okay, seen it. Is that the payload I'm seeing swinging about underneath yeah, it? That's the payload, yeah. 
Looks a bit like a solo, 3DR solo. It might be, I'm not sure. Nah, I That's think it's first drop. no. This is too big for a solo. <laughs> All right, Mick. It's starting I to think... look like the cure might be worse than the complaint. A rotor blade to the face and a box on the head. Absolutely. <laughs> I think, mate, we, I think we better let you go back to your busy day of judging and stuff like that there. Um, All right. Thank, and you, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very, very much for taking the time uh, to show us what's going on there. Best of luck with it all. Uh, I hope it all goes as well as it normally does. And uh, have a wonderful party at the end of it. Uh, send my regards to everybody. I will do. Thank you. Cool. Take care, mate. Cheers. Wow. That's amazing. 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 Technology, eh? It's a wonderful thing. It'll be a little bit quieter now. Um, but and yeah, he was flying, flying beyond my visual line of sight. He was. He was. Uh, wow. Well, you know, that's that's <laughs> pretty complex uh, or completely autonomous landing operations 20 nautical miles away from the launch point with a vision based system and other stuff. And then uh, I know the aircraft's going to wind itself down and then they. Uh, so last time it was a, a, a vial of blood that they, they, they put in, and it was a flower, actually, they put in a test tube. Um, but then the, the person at the other end could simply press a button, and then the thing had to start itself up and go again and take itself back. You know, it is pr pretty impressive stuff, really. Um, we've, we've all done those fully autonomous landings, you know, when a wing fails or something goes Oh, yeah. Wrong. Oh, I do those all the time. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, landings and the takeoffs are optional, as they say. No, it's exciting stuff, and good luck to them all. Um, and that that competition, you know, I'm on my ranty horse again, but that really has done more to drive the technology that that rest of the industry is using than any other competition out there. That's where you've got your uh, um, geo fences, your um, fail safes. They have for many years. They had big. Um, it must crash systems if it went out of, if the aircraft went out of uh, limits and or out of a boundary fence and they crash lots of airplanes in the name of safety <laughs> in, in that one um, but it really has it's driven driven no end of the technology that we all use day to day so good luck to them and fair play now where should we where should we go back to where do we want to go back to should we go back to precision hawk or should we go back to um, air traffic where should we go back to bruce i'll let you lead I don't know, but actually speaking of going, you know, the restraints so they don't fly too far away, I see that tethering is becoming a big thing in the regulations. I think both, was it Australia and the FAA both looking at tethering, the special rules for tethered drones? Uh, was it One of them was a maximum tether length of 45 metres and you must be more than 50 metres away from a runway when you're flying it. And yeah, I think tethered drones have got a big future actually, like for uh, providing relay sites for um, radio links and things in, in times of disaster because they're not going to be affected by the wind in the way a balloon is. So, yeah, I think the regulators in this case are starting to think a little bit ahead. Well, CNN were the people that uh, have uh, tethered, they have one of those photo kite things, I think they're called, but someone would correct me in the comments, I'm sure, if I'm wrong. Uh, but yeah, CNN were the big, they're, they're big players uh, for that, for having tethered things for news gathering. Um, yeah, and if you've got power up the cord, then you you, you perhaps uh, up the tether. You're, you're talking about pretty persistent systems. Yes. Um, didn't you say? I oh, just yeah. <laughs> this is, oh, thanks. <laughs> didn't you? Um, uh, oh, didn't you say to me before we started that CAS is also kicking some more regulations about? Yeah, CASA are just are doing another consultation. They're making some changes to drone rules. Most of them affect commercial operators, but there are some that will also affect uh, recreational operators. That's to do with distances from airfields and operation on this extended visual line of sight thing. So they've got a form up on their website, and I would encourage people to go and have a say because you should always have, always have your say. Otherwise, you can't complain when things don't go your way. And, yeah, it's, it's interesting that this is a very minor tweaking to the regulations, but it is stuff that will affect some people because CASA have this really cool, the, the best piece of regulation is uh, in terms of uncontrolled airports, you can fly anywhere you like until an airplane comes along, then you've got to land. Brilliant. I mean, that's common sense. Why is there a problem if you're flying near an airport and there are no planes? So yeah. they recognize that and, and they basically say, so you can go in and say, yes, we love this idea. Keep it up. Um, otherwise, 
someone will complain and they'll go back to the stupid was it four miles or something or other from from a, from an airport which is lunacy because like there are so many small uncontrolled airports which get one or two movements a day and to ex completely exclude operations within four miles of that airport simply because it's active for 15 minutes a day is lunacy but that's the way most other countries work here in new zealand if it's a an uncontrolled airfield or a controlled airfield you've got to be four kilometers away even if it's only gets one movement a week yeah it's a big chunk of airspace isn't it um it really is. Uh, I've, Chris, I've uh, just put uh, your details in. Uh, uh, I was going to say, gonna have to say his name. <laughs> Pudu Jabba <laughs> is in the comments. And I've told him to, if anyone wants to get in touch with you, uh, probably LinkedIn is the place, isn't it? I think, Chris. Facebook for grown ups. Gee, that's terrible. Yeah, yeah. LinkedIn is where I've um, been holding all my posts. And uh, that's where I check. Yeah, cool. All right. So that's that's a great place to find and find some of your videos as well. Have you got a, a YouTube channel as well with all this stuff on? I do. I don't have as much on there um, as I do my LinkedIn. So I pretty much LinkedIn is going to be my main platform right now. Okay, cool. All right. Well, hopefully some people will, will get in touch with you. And I think we you need to get in, we need to get you in touch with the friend our friends at Altitude Angel, Richard, uh, because also you know they've got they sit on. Tons of data for worldwide. If you look at the drone safety map on SUS News and zoom in to your locality, you'll see just how much data they have of power lines and schools and uh, hospitals and blah, 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 blah. All sorts of other granular data that other, other systems just don't reach. And will be the things we'll need in the future when we're all grown ups and all operating in busy skies. But I. Well, I keep rattling back into my mind, which is something that you mentioned last week uh, in your rant, Bruce, is at the end of the day, how many more of us there are than them? And we really have got to be changing the the, the way the, the narrative runs. Uh, yes, uh, and to what you were speaking to earlier about seeing that manned aircraft coming, well, they've got to get equipped. <laughs> they've, they've got to get equipped so they can get out of our way. That's interesting. I had a response to what some of my, one of my rants from a GA pilot that said that, that we should all have um, electronic, we should have ADSB on all our drones, and uh, because it's too too dangerous for pilots, you know, um, to have all these drones around without ADSB. And and I, my comment was, well, don't go below 500 feet, and you won't have a problem. And until all manned aircraft have to have, have to have ADSB, why should all drones? Because if you even in, as of 2020. In the USA, when ADSB becomes mandatory, it's only mandatory in controlled airspace. Class G, you still don't need it, and that's pretty much the same around the world. So it's a bit rude for pilots to suggest that our drones must have ADSB when flying in Class G below 400 feet, but they shouldn't have to have it. Well, there's not enough codes, is there? There's not enough codes for us all. There's so many of them. That's that's one of the primary sort of fails of of, of, of no vision in 1990 when they started this. Stand. We'll soon have ADSB plus. <laughs> or something like that that'll take care of it but uh, it's, it's speaking about the rant i noticed i did the one about we need to have representation in new zealand because of all the stuff um there were only a few hundred uh, comments on that video and, and a lot of them were from outside new zealand and i noticed that chad's freedom fpv freedom coalition i've got an, i've got a youtube channel and the videos have had like 14 views everyone talks but no one's prepared to actually get off their bums and sign up it's like it's a great idea yeah yeah but um, so everyone else can join it i'll just sit here and do nothing because um i'm too can't be bothered there seems to be a huge amount of apathy within the community and that's why these these moves as well intended as they are and as essential as they are i don't know that they're going to work i think we're just too apathetic to actually get off our backsides and do the stuff that the for example the ultralight community did in the usa where they because it's crazy we've got people flying around in uncertified aircraft with no licenses and no need to even register um, and they can do what the hell they like, basically. But if you take your toy drone outside the USA, you've got to register it. You've got to do this and that and the other. It's like, why has one group got no rights? And the other group can do whatever the hell they want. It's simply because the, the ultralight people were well organized and they went out and they pitched their case properly and they got all the, virtually all the concessions they wanted. The, the drone flyers are sitting here going, oh, it's terrible, it's terrible. But I can't be bothered, you know, getting off my backside and doing anything about it. Well, they'll yeah, but they'll shoot you down straight away by saying uh, the ultralight guy's got skin in the game. Therefore, uh, safety is his priority because his life is at stake or her life. Yeah, but that doesn't that doesn't work when you look at GA. I mean, I was looking at the things you haven't seen channel, which is yes, I watched that. Yeah, yes. yeah. 
<laughs> and I saw an aircraft, the guy was high on cocaine, he'd been recklessly flying for several days around an area, and he basically stalled his plane, fell out of the sky, and killed himself and his passenger. That's the sort of thing, he's got skin in the game, doesn't stop him being stupid. So I don't think skin in the game is a real, um, if it, skin in the game was an issue, then people wouldn't do reckless things in manned aircraft and people wouldn't kill themselves. Well, fair enough, you've got the response to that then. But uh, the manned aviation has definitely got to raise, raise its game. Um, and, you know, and then here we are, Chris comes along with an augmented reality solution where you could end up having, you know, your RPA operator having a fantastic um, a synthetic sky picture, a view of what's going on, situ amazing situational awareness. And yet, yeah, then comes mum and pop in the Cessna. Brrr, you know, poor eyesight, can't see more than a f f 50 feet. And, and, and high, uh, on high, level. high on cocaine. High on cocaine, yeah. How, how, can, how can that, how can it be that, that that is allowed? It's a bit controversial to say that. I'm a pilot, but, you know, something's got to change in that regard. And then you've got Nicola who just does whatever he likes. <laughs> does whatever he likes. Ruining the hobby one flight at a time. One, one flight at a time. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I just, in the, on the, in the car, a lot of comments, uh, some, men, some were mentioned about Precision Hawk earlier. And um, uh, Ian Gates says, Precision Hawk's marketing is on point, but their products leave a lot to be desired. Maybe that is part of the magic, is actually having a product that works. Um, both the aircraft... They have augmented reality. The, the product list is just, you know, augmented reality. It's not augmented, reality. augmented product, yes. <laughs> yes. It's a yeah. little, an illusion. Yeah. It, yeah, they had a... The, well, I won't say too much, but the Lancaster aircraft was very interesting. Search around for that uh, if you have never heard of their aircraft. And they pivoted from that to the uh, software solutions. And anyone looking to buy a drone, I saw there's one for sale. It's, Is it? it um, Seven hundred million dollars it cost that Boeing thing that that Germany had, and they want to sell to Canada or something. I don't know. Have you seen that? They've... Are they trying to sell on the Global Hawks they got? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I looked for it on eBay or Craigslist or something, I suppose. <laughs> well, I guess, well, do you remember there was that big fuss about um, the first predator or whatever it was across the, the Atlantic to um, to England uh, just recently in the last couple of months? Well, that, that made me smile because they flew those Global Hawks in a couple of years ago to Germany. The, the Global yeah, Hawks... Yeah. Oh, yeah. The one, the one, uh, very early one uh, came mm. came to Australia, and I think that one they 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 launched it from America. It landed there, and a man opened up the lid and topped it up with fuel. Glug, 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 shut the lid and sent it back again. I don't think they touched it when it uh, when it went back. That was one of the very early proving flights. That wasn't it. it was all the back and forth. Yeah, I think uh, so. Yeah, this very 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 impressive aeroplane that nobody wants. But anyway. Um, <laughs> Because <laughs> the satellite satellites very nicely um, fit that, and the Air Force uh, kept the TR one U two program going uh, under some sort of political uh, shenanigans, basically, uh, to keep that going. So that has kind of kind of done for that. Uh, what else do we have to look at in the comments? Yeah, I don't oh, know. And the ultimate the ultimate BV loss flight. Japanese landed on an asteroid. Yes, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Yes, very. How true. did they get that past the regulators? Eh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know indeed. We should talk a little bit more to Nicola there. What have you been doing and where have your videos been? Come on. Okay, vacation is the big word of the day and for the past three weeks or so. So, yeah, I've been outside of the country for 10 days and honestly, I was planning to get some to take something with me either the nano talon or some copter and right as i was loading up the car i only took the phantom with me and uh, guess what happened for 10 days i used the phantom the phantom's whole package backpack to block out the light coming from the fridge in the hotel room <laughs> and that that was yeah, that was its uh, sole purpose for that trip. I just couldn't muster up the motivation and desire to go out and fly anything. I would just blanked out when it came to RC. Just, just a vacation. <laughs> nothing <laughs> nothing RC that. related. Yeah. Nothing. Did, and did you go to Ibiza or something? Too what? much clubbing. Too many cocktails and clubbing at Ibiza, was it? No, I think it's too much RC. <laughs> 
and I just felt the need to <laughs> to forget about that. And when I came back, I was so depressed that I'm back that it took me about two weeks to get back up, get back up to speed. So yeah, I've been resting for a bit, but should be getting back to normal schedule right now. So I haven't really done much uh, aside from uh, having a look at the uh, crosswind, crosswind thingy. Yeah, that's quite this a big is, thing. It, it's huge, actually. The believers fuselage goes to about here. Wow. So this has the same wingspan, but it's uh, what twenty, at least twenty centimeters longer fuselage, and it's much bulkier in the center. The whole fuselage it looks a lot bulkier than the the believer looks tiny in comparison. Wow! And so there's Which, plenty of room for. Ca is that the thing that can take three SLR cameras or whatever it is? Yeah, that would take a lot of imagination to fit them all in there, but I think it will be able to carry them. That certainly has the space. I mean, it's it's one open open compartment from here all the way up to here. So basically, you know, yeah, yeah, you can you can wear it like an Iron Man suit or something. <laughs> uh, Chris iForce 2D, maker of the flying wardrobe, uh, is uh, is just commenting: is cross wing or cross wind? Cross wing. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> this plane has so many wings. I'm starting to get confused. Which one? It's Nimbus Pro. It's cross wind. Okay, might have said it wrong a few times. Yeah, I think it's cross wind. But um. There are a lot of pieces that actually need gluing, and it didn't come with an instruction manual. So today I spent two hours trying to find each, uh, trying to find a place for each piece. And I actually have a few pieces that I have no idea where they're supposed to go. And I'm certainly hoping they're not important <laughs> because I'm, that's, I just don't know where they should go. It wasn't like that for the believer actually, because it was a lot simpler. Things sort of. They were obvious where they should be, but that's one peculiar thing. I think I haven't confirmed that with Charles yet, although I'm not sure he would even admit it. But I think the people that build the Believer might be the ones making the crosswind now. So, did the box come with all the groovy little stickers and all that that you get with a Believer? Uh, all the little battery. Well, well, this is the sticker thingy that came with the believer, and I think these are cable labels. They're not, yeah. they're not meant to be put on the plane, but uh, some things, the way things have been made, have been done on this plane, are identical to, to the scheme for the believer, and that's what leads me to believe that either the person who designed this took a huge dose of inspiration from the believer like 90 percent <laughs> changing a few things here and there and the tail obviously or you know just the people that make the believer now make this for my flight dream because a lot it's made quite a lot of the things are very similar okay but that's not a bad thing because this seems like it will be able to carry a ton of gear or batteries. And, uh, yeah, the fuselage is absolutely massive. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it could be, be even, even the Believer can be a bit of a, because it hasn't got sort of any thumb holds or anything in it, to, to launch it can be a bit of a, you know. That actually has never been a problem for me. I just grab it by the tail right at the back, and it's quite comfortable to handle. But are you, just... um, are you flying it at, at, at all up weight, at max all up weight, or are you flying it underneath? Because we fly ours right right up to the last, within 50 grams of uh, max all up weight. Well, certainly not at all up weight. 
No, I'm I'm not sure how much. I, I'm not sure what's the weight on that plane, but I'm I'd be surprised if it's over four kilograms. Oh, we or are maybe four. If it, it, maybe if it is, it's not a lot over four kilograms. Uh, right now, I'm actually thinking of building a battery out of out of these cells for the uh, for the crosswind, and uh, I'm still debating whether to put that. I mentioned it to you, the uh, Cyclops, uh, sto no, uh, the Tornado, or if I should flash another Omnibus F4 Pro with the audio pilot code and use that one, then that would be hilarious to put an autopilot that's this big on a plane that's, you know, a monster yeah. like yeah. this. This yeah. is by yeah. far the largest plane I've had around here. And... Uh, I'm really curious what XUAV are going to do with the clouds too, because now they claim it's going to be one two point one meter wingspan when it finally comes out. I'm not sure if the fuselage is going to be bulkier than this. I highly doubt it. Well, we definitely, you'll definitely get to the point where um, you can't launch it, but, but of course we'll get Gordon as as um, <laughs> yeah we'll get Gordon. Uh, I saw I saw his magnificent launches on your your last video there. Um, but no, it is, it is an issue. I think that when you get above five kilos, whatever shape it is, it's hard to launch because it's quite hard well, to lift. Nathan, Nathan didn't think so, and I think he used to load his up quite a bit for those five-hour flights. Yeah, but he's he's at low, relative. We're at five thousand feet here, so he's relatively right. low level on a hot day. So I think that's our our main problem. Is, okay, uh, then. Uh... Then just find a cliff and throw it off. The exactly. Cliff. Yes. Yes. That is Problem definitely the way forward. We. Uh, she set up the fourth one the other day. I, the the believer I love, and I I truly think we're going to be in for some six hour airframes within the next two years. And once we've hit that right. six hours, then that's it. You for mapping, you don't don't need anything because six hours is about the useful daylight in a day. So that's yeah. it. As soon as soon as that's there, yeah. then the job's done. I've gotten some data from people that have actually received this plane before me, and I also have some efficient in, efficiency numbers from Charles, which, if they turn out to be true, would mean that this plane, all loaded up to about 5 kilograms, is twice as efficient as the clouds. And uh, that would be mighty impressive because um, because that thing is huge. And I really find that pointing nose to be an interesting decision. And it's obviously not, not strictly made for FPV, just like the Believer. It's more mapping oriented. But, you know, I'm not going to start doing mapping all of a sudden. No reason. Don't have it. Don't even have the gear to do so. So I'm gonna modify it for FPV. But still, interesting stuff. And these planes are getting bigger and better. Yeah, no, no, the they, tail, they, they the tail assembly is fascinating. The tail assembly is fascinating. And you know, fingers crossed, it doesn't just decide to leave the plane at some point during a flight. <laughs> Yes, I think it's the very, very most, the least we can hope for in a lot of ways. The, um, has anyone played, what was those FRs, what's what's the floor's opinion of those FR Sky receivers that have been put out as super cheap? Is it the R9, R6, R whatever? Watch my channel. I've just um, been doing some testing and I've put them on the bench and had a look at them. Yeah, they're pretty good. They've got a Laura chip in them. They, um, this, this, you know, they are exceptional value for money. But when you look at it, if you do the component pricing, the receivers these days, the, the cost of the components is so very small that the majority of any margin is basically covering the development of the firmware and the testing and all that sort of stuff. So it's, um, yeah, it's really, so far, it looks pretty damn schmick. And as I said, I did some testing on the weekend. I flew to the limits of visual um, line of sight and no problems at all. <laughs> With you. Oh, it was it EV loss or, um, or, or yeah, no, did no, you move it quickly? Just, no, it was good. I could see the model at all times because they had a camera. No, I can't say that. No, um, no, but, no. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, interesting that everyone's talking about these huge planes for, for extended durations. I'm currently working on a very small model for 
beyond visual line of sight because I figure if I'm going to fly beyond visual line of sight, I want to make sure that if something happens, I'm not a danger to anybody or anything. And I figure if I make a 200 gram model out of EPP and it's a flying wing and the motor's at the back and there's no sharp bits, even if it does fall from the sky or go through a propeller of a helicopter, it's not going to cause an issue any more than a you know a sparrow or a starling would. So. Uh, by by going safe, you know, if someone comes along and says, oh, you're breaking the rules, I'll say, well, okay, can you tell me exactly how this is going to injure anyone or damage something? And ultimately, in a court of law, they've got to prove that that is the case. Uh, so that's where I'm going from. I want to make it possible by making it safer. Absolutely. Now, FX node mm -hmm. in the comments is asking, what's the powertrain, Nicola, for your machine? Uh, right here. LD power... Uh, 2820, 595 kV, that's supposed to be a 6S system. And I think the props, the props supplied were missing in action, apparently. But uh, it came with two 11 by 7 wood props counter-rotating. I like wood props. I like wood props a lot. Hang on. Yeah. yeah, I just well, actually, I, just because they're nice, <laughs> not for any real. And they're very light. They're nice and they light. Are. And, they are. If you have a crash, they don't break your They don't bend your motor shaft. There's a lot of benefits to wooden props. Not as efficient, unfortunately. Yeah, but they're nice. Um, they nice. I'm actually, I'm actually not sure if uh, the efficiency figures Charles gave me were with these motors specifically because I haven't really asked about this but he said 65 uh, milliamps per kilometer on 6s for a five kilogram plane Gee, that's that, good that's you yeah that's yeah when, my, when, it, when it comes when it comes to efficiency nothing succeeds like 6s <laughs> really yeah, that's, that been the, that the that's been my experience as well for the most part although it at a certain size 4s makes more sense for, for something a bit smaller but i guess i'll see 600 kv you might get the job done certainly would need an 11 or even a 12 inch prop but speaking of small <laughs> don't talk about bruce like that well, i've told you before <laughs> this, told is you something that I also, this is something that i also got this week no wait last yeah, mini week. Win. yeah it's the new sonic model thingy and this is this you know a model of a model and the bigger and one think, flies really well yeah i think i'll be able to, i'd be able to fit the omnibus with the rg pilot cord in it and we'll have some fun with it for a short while, although I'm really not a huge fan of flying wings, but this is just, I can just toss it, and I, I can lose this in the car, actually. It's so <laughs> small. And then, well, again, you could get Gordon over to fly it. Bruce, I think you should do uh, a, a, a whiteboard video of why 6S is best, uh, and explain it for dummies, i.e. me, why that would be. Yeah, I'll, just, I'll just write because on the whiteboard, and it will do it. Oh, okay. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Perhaps I should, because it is amazing with even with mini quads, where typically you're getting like three minutes out of a 4S setup. When you go to 6S, you can get like six or seven minutes. And I was watching a guy flying at the airfield on the weekend. He's thrashing this really high performance 6S mini quad. And when he landed, his maximum current draw was 34 amps compared to a, to a four cell system where you're pulling 90 to 95 amps. It's an amazingly yeah. amount lower uh, in the, uh, yeah. current draw. Yeah. It's whiteboard video, please. <laughs> Explain. Talk very slowly to me. Very just imagine your target audience, Bruce, when you're doing it. Just think of your target audience. Actually, funny thing is that a lot of people ask me about power systems, and I always go, well, you, you know, this and this and this, and they're all 6S. And he goes, well, I've got a lot of batteries, like 4S batteries, so... Uh, maybe i can uh, i can do a system like that and i go like well then i i really can't help you because you're gonna need something depending on the motor and my experience with 4s motors is that something this big is more than capable of pulling in excess of 60 amps and 
just the speed controller you're going to need. And when you put two of those, those speed controllers are at least twice as heavy as the 6S ones I'm using. And on the, I think the Believer maxes out at 30, around 30 amps full throttle during takeoff. And then it's just sipping something like 5 amps. And when I talk to people with 4S systems, they quote like, well, you know, during takeoff, I see something like 50, 60 amps. And just imagine the thickness of wire you're going to need to carry that current safely without, you know, melting a connector or heating up. And the believer is wired with, I think, 16... I don't think I even have 14, uh, 14 uh, AWG wires on it. I think most of it, probably uh, between the battery and the uh, power distribution board, but everything after that is 16 or less. Well, yeah, 16 you, or yeah. higher. To give you a clue as to why higher voltage works better, the formula for power is I squared R, and it's the, the I, which is the current, is squared. So every time you make a small increase in current, you massively, um, in, in, or every time you increase the power, you increase the current. And the idea is that any resistive losses you've got will rapidly get uh, turn the, the current into heat rather than into motive force. So as you raise up the voltage, you lower the, the current, and therefore you're losing less through all those resistive losses you normally get in the motor and the wires and the connectors and so forth. So you're just wasting less power effectively. Mm. Yeah, and you use thinner wires and save weight. And those, uh, those 6S ESCs are like 20, 30 gram stops. And when you have to put two 80 amp ESCs for a 4S setup, uh, that's a lot of weight. Yeah, because even the heat sinking on the ESC can be a lot lower because the current is flowing lower and, and it's the, the current that does the heating. Yeah, there you go. exactly. 6S all the way then. So 6S, 6-hour six, six platforms. Bring them on. Make them so. But they'll be here, they'll be make, here next year. If, if you find people have got a lot of 4S batteries, you can always buy a 2S and run it in series with the 4S and you get a 6S. Mm-hmm. Oh. Well, yes. Yeah, it has to be same capacity, though. Yeah, same, but same brand, same capacity. I mean, I've done that in the past. I've because it's really hard to get high capacity, high cell count batteries in New Zealand because of all the shipping regulations. So I've got an EDF, and I couldn't get a five thousand milliamp six cell pack. So I got two um, three cell five thousand milliamp packs, and on the series works fine. The benefit of that also is if you end up with a dead cell, you've only lost half your battery. Yeah, that is true. But I think I think the crosswind is gonna be in that six hour. I think it's gonna hit that six hour mark because it's got a absolutely massive fuselage and just just see the the thickness of this thing. This has definitely has more core than the believer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Lot huge. More. It's huge. Lot more wing area. Cody Bounds yeah. is saying, what about in a slow flyer like an Event 38 E384? A slow flyer? Well, that's uh, an E384 is a, um, uh, what is it? Uh, I can't remember what they're actually called. It's that, the high wing um, FPV thing popular years ago with the carbon tail boom. Skyhawk. Um, Skyhawk. 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 Something, Sky, yeah, Skyhawk. one of those. Yeah. <laughs> Sky. <laughs> Whatever. Right. Yeah. What about them? Well, is would a uh, would a six S be beneficial in that situation? Yeah, in any situation, oh. um, you have a different motor and a different prop. That's all, and a different ESC and different batteries. But apart from that, everything's the same. Uh, it's the same. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, uh, I don't know about those Skywalkers because. Uh, I think probably, yeah, but these are really slow planes. I mean, that thing just refuses to go quick, no matter what you do. But still, if you want to go 6S, the thing is that if you invest in 6S gear, you've got to run 6S all the way. Right now, I don't have the ability to build a 4S plane because I just don't have the batteries, the motors, the ESCs, nothing. And I definitely refuse to use thick cables because they're a nightmare to solder. So I, even if I wanted to, I 
I'd have to order a lot of parts to go see, to go for it. So you know, you gotta you gotta decide for yourself what you want to do. Supporting two systems at the same time doesn't matter if you're gonna be ordering stuff anyway. Probably, but then you have to have uh, 4S and 6S batteries, and I actually mainly have 6S batteries now. And that voltage kind of works for me, and I, and I don't think I want to go to 4S. 4S is fine for this. This is probably going to get flown on 4S. Uh, the Nano Talon is on 4S. I'm fine running these things on 4S, and I, I've got the gear for that. I've, I don't have a gear to outfit a large plane like this with 4S. Uh, Chris is uh, iForce 2D saying he's uh, is attempting to fly his wardrobe on 4S and he's not entirely optimistic about it. I'm sorry, Chris, I am, I am downing your, your aircraft, calling it a wardrobe. But uh, it, I'm just wondering if the comments, I wonder how far out that is and will you be will you be um, uh, maidening it uh, at Tokara so we can see both uh, Ron yes. and... Yes, he's going to. He said he's going to maiden it at Tokara, and I'm hoping it'll be on Halloween because then we'll have a witch, a wardrobe, we'll only need a lion. But if you, if you did it on November the 5th, you could go direct to Bonfire. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's great. Yes. It's secondary that's, use. <laughs> that's right. That's a, that's, sorry, Chris. That's very, very rude of me. I'm sure it'll be very, very good. And, oh, good. Well, they will have multiple camera angles, um, and uh, it'll be interesting. Nine kilograms of clothing storage. <laughs> yeah. it's, oh, it could, it's designed to one could sell to Ikea or something like that. That'd be great. <laughs> It'd be yeah. great. I hope it gets Gordon to launch it, though. Yeah, I've got to. Got to get Gordon to launch it, but it was uh, it was tail dragger right? looking at the maiden in early 2025. He says at this point, <laughs> well, that's what well, he's, um, he's brought it it's forward a bit. Yeah, 25 minutes past eight. That's a bit late. Is it light at this time of year over there? It must be. It must be long summer Daylight evening. Daylight saving this weekend. Daylight saving starts this weekend, so our days are going to get longer. Woo! Ah, uh, we don't get that here. Do you, do, do you get much? Uh, oh, I was talking about New Zealand, New Zealand, and now from the New Zealand Tourism Board, uh, do you it's get an extra, hour, an extra hour of daylight? Well, it's not really that. People say, "Oh, my curtains will fade." Yes, they will. Um, but yeah, it's an extra hour in the evenings of, of light, which is great. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, we, we don't get that here. It's just it's always always about the same time. <laughs> sunset. And sunset. Going the big the big bonuses, around here. Yeah. The big bonus is I can. Uh, I don't have to get ready to do this webcast until 10 o'clock in the morning instead of 9. That's fantastic. Wow, there you go. Oh, that's marvellous. Well, on that note, I suppose as look, we're 17 minutes over. Um, if anyone, uh, is, Did anyone else see anything else that they want to talk about that you've seen this week before we go? Only the FAA reauthorization bill, which is due to go through before the uh, end of September. Of course. And yes, I yes. see the AMA have put out a video pleading with their members to write to their congressman. I think too little, too late. But um, And well, someone else uh, commented on that video. That, that what, why um, why haven't you contacted all the big names on YouTube and got them to get the message out? Because the video when I watched it the other night had 2,000 views, which from a membership of over 200,000, pretty pretty pitiful. Because of the short lead time, they wouldn't have had time to mail out to all the members. They, I think they totally dropped the ball on that. They were just, what were they thinking? Well, how many times have we discussed it? And uh, two hundred thousand people haven't come to watch it here. No, but I mean, we've. But it's, this is a, a topic that's been we've been kicking this ball around for what two years, <laughs> something like yeah. that. When I, when I put my first video out showing how the AMA would just silence, there was no voice. They came back and said, "Oh no, we're working on this and we have strategies and blah blah." You know, this is unfair. Well, I think I was dead right, actually, to be totally honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's very sad. It's coming back. There's shock and surprise and awe all around. Uh, I, I must admit that's why I haven't put it in SES News because it's like, man, too late, boys. <laughs> One like, thing in the reauthorization bill, they have actually defined what a community-based organisation is. This has previously been undefined. Now there's actually a definition of a CBO, so that's going to make life interesting. But of course, if the Section three three six is revoked, it's all academic. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly, and that's the the big headline coming away from most places. Is you know suddenly they'll have the right to shoot down model aircraft and RPAs and things like that, and that's what the media is. Anyway. Uh, yeah, you but that's what the, the right. You just the need a gun. You don't need a right. Yeah. You don't need a right. You don't need a wrong. You don't need anything. Yeah, it's it's got to be done. And I noticed a couple of big YouTubers in the UK 
have suddenly decided they'll talk about uh, what the, the what's just happened there with the government uh, survey uh, a week after you had to submit <laughs> the survey. It's like, come on, guys. Uh, yeah, uh, as as a as a whole, as a community, we definitely need to. Uh, if there's a something happening in New Zealand and people in New Zealand need us to apply for something or write out on comment on something or in australia or america or whatever as a community we've all got to do it we've all got to help each other uh, and drag ourselves away from the abyss of the hobby being taken away by um amazon and people like that that's the bottom line they want that first 400 feet uh, it had no value before it's got value now um and it be whether it works or not that's what they want. They they want that airspace, or we'll have to all go and move in uh, with uh, Nicola, and because uh, there's no regulations and it's all good, so we'll be all round his house. Is that fair? Yeah, you're welcome to come by. <laughs> there, there we are. Oh, fantastic. Do you have a menu and things? Do we know what we're going to get fed? Uh, more than enough restaurant <laughs> around. <laughs> Cool, man. All right. Uh, well, what's just this? Just uh, FA will be able to regulate CBO like AMA. Yeah, yeah, you're right, Richard. It's all it's all a nightmare. And on that happy note, <laughs> it, it remains for me to um, to say um, thank you very much indeed to Chris. Find Chris on, on LinkedIn. Uh, I've put uh, put his name in the comments. Uh, so find him on LinkedIn and find out all about his augmented reality work. Uh, you know where to find um, Bruce XJet or RC model reviews causing trouble all over the internet since 1749. And um, and then, of course, our man there, Nicola, in Bulgaria, the land of the free, where you could do whatever you like, it seemed. Uh, remind us again, remind everybody in the name of your channel, Nicola. Archangel RC. Archangel RC. So like, subscribe, and do whatever else you need to do on his channel. And don't forget to join us again at uh, 2100 GMT next week um, when hopefully we'll all be a little more lucid. Have a lovely week, the rest of the week, and if you're flying at the weekend, be safe. Uh, thanks very much, dear viewers. Cheers. Take care. Bye-bye.